Hi guys, welcome to CNG Productions. You're here with Paul today. Uh, me and Tom have been at Mantic Games HQ in Nottingham all day playing Walking Dead All Out War. We've been speaking to Rob um, from Mantic Games and now we've got a very special guest. This is Mark Latham. Hello. He is, hello. hello. <laughs> he is the games designer behind the Walking Dead All Out War. So Mark, you just want to tell us a bit about all out war basically and, and you know what is what is a, a games designer in relation to the tabletop industry? Well that's a, quite a big opening question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah All Out War is uh, a great was a great opportunity for me actually to do a, yeah. a, a really big licensed product. Um, previously I've worked on stuff like Batman the Miniatures game and Marvel Universe Miniatures games. Awesome, we're, um, we're both, myself and Tom are both fans of that game. Yeah, um, I've kind of worked as a consultant and editor for those, so actually great. tackling one as lead designer was a, a really good opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so Ronnie, uh, but Mantic's Ronnie of course. Ronnie he, Renton, he's zombie a, Ronnie. He's no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when he rang me up and offered me this gig, uh, you know, I jumped at the chance because I absolutely love The Walking Dead. Alright, so you're a fan of the, the comic book series yeah, and, and the TV series? And the TV series. Yeah. Excellent, um, no spoilers. And the video games. And <laughs> the Telltale series. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. So, so basically, as you, you touched on there, the license of, of The Walking Dead, yeah. it is at the moment, as we all know, fantastic. Um, the, with the TV series and also with the Telltale game series that's coming out, I think that's getting another expansion on yeah, top of yeah. that isn't it I believe and um, obviously we're at this point we're through season 7 of The Walking Dead halfway yep. point and we're just waiting to see what happens now and no spoilers and um, so you know it's got to be a bit of pressure working on the, the, the Walking Dead I mean it's it's hugely popular both as a comic book and TV series very much. it's got a lot of really die hard fans yeah. and the TV fans and the comic fans are often different beasts as yeah. well and they're very yeah. precious about their, their little part of the yeah. RPG um, I am a fan of both I uh, absolutely good. love both, uh, and this game is completely based on the comic IP, yeah. so we don't cross the streams. That's no, really that's, quite important. That's good. So um, Rick will eventually lose his hand. I'm afraid that is a given, and that is the only spoiler we should really give. <laughs> only because it's on the posters. Only because it's on the posters, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically that, that's all we can say. Yeah, yeah so, so what type of what type of pressures, what, what type of research did you do into, obviously being a fan, I mean what, what type of considerations that's coming when designing the game itself? Well the biggest the biggest chore obviously was reading the comics again from issue one. Oh, and that's oh, such a it's chore. unbelievable, it took <laughs> so long and it's just hard work. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, yeah, reading comics was actually the, 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 main, <laughs> <laughs> the main bit of research and the main inspiration behind the game. Yeah. Uh, so that was pretty good fun. Fantastic. Um, but there's a real kind of, it's not co-op game. No. Um, and there's, there's a real kind of pressure to reflect that IP yeah. that, you know, the, the, the walkers yeah. are this kind of force of nature yeah. who aren't actually the main threat. The main threat is other humans who've yeah. gone bad yeah. and are just trying to fight to survive, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but kind of have these walkers roaming around. So if you kind of go out of the game zone, you're going to get eaten. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. So it's kind of kind of the walkers. We we've touched on it when we've um, we've done the unboxing video and when we've done um, battle reports that the walkers are kind of like uh, terrain with a threat level. To yeah, them. that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so you kind of you, you you dictate your gameplay around not only your opponent but also your, the walkers and, and what can happen with them. Yeah, and it was really important to us that you never had your opponent basically controlling walkers all the time, yeah. um, that they could do something on their own as well. So there's that real unpredictability. They will always move towards noise yeah. and they will always come towards you if you do something silly like throw a grenade or find new assault rifles. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> that knowing look. <laughs> um, but at the same time there's these random events that happen where they'll just kind of wander around and activate um, so th there's always unpredictability ab about walkers, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important. And again, they, they're quite um, they're quite harmless almost on their own. Yeah, yeah. Um, by themselves, they're, they're, yeah. they're easy to manage. We've we've discovered that playing a couple of games. If you've not played it, you know it, the walkers are easy to manage by themselves. Yeah. Once more walkers start showing up. Yeah, and we represent the fact that it, they get exponentially harder as well. Yeah. It's not just a case of oh, two or three, there's, there's a set outnumbering bonus. Yeah. They, they literally, that bonus ramps up so fast. Oh, ridiculous. As soon as you get four or five on you, they are only so many die, so yeah, the hardest characters will go down. Yeah, the, the big men will go down. Like Negan, sadly. I've been in the scenario playing a solo play game, because I love Negan. 
I love them in the comic books, and I've been in a solo play game situation where it's just been Negan and I just thought, you know what, I'll just go around with bot walkers, yeah. and it's just got... People have asked me, how do you take down Negan because he's so tough, and I say, well, <laughs> basically, you wait until he walks in the middle of a load of, of, of walkers, <laughs> and then you walk on the other side of him and shoot him. <laughs> Even if you don't kill him, they all go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and then you run away. <laughs> he's a tough character, he really is. So, on the, on the subject of characters, so you've got obviously main straight characters, the likes of Rick, the likes of Carl, Michonne. Did you design the rules around how you felt they would operate within the game, or how do you, ref uh, do, or do, do you feel the, uh, the character cards represent them as comic book characters? You know, Rick's got his leader ability yeah. to be able to, to calm everything down, which, which is quite Rick, yeah. like controlling everyone and just being like, you know, let's, let's, let's level the playing field out here. And yeah, exactly. Um, so every character has to, has to work the way they do in the comic book. Yeah. That's an absolute, you know, you can't cross that line. They, no. they have to do that. And I always start designing with feel. Yeah. So I'll actually put miniatures on the table and start working out how I want things to move around and what I want them to do, yeah. how I want miniatures to influence the gameplay without actually putting any mechanic behind them at all. Oh, right. So I'm quite an intuitive game designer, that's the, that's the way I approach. Yeah. So kind of big picture and then work out the mechanics. Um, so for each character, we're going to do several versions of each one yeah. and representing them at different stages in the story. Yeah. Um, so the first Rick is quite idealistic, <clears throat> he's, a, he's a cop, he still wears his badge, yeah. um, he's a pretty good shot. Yeah. Um, he's fairly confident, he's a good leader, he can calm down the threat. Mm -hmm. um, whereas later, when he loses his hand, he goes through a bit of a dark period. Yeah. Um, he won't be quite as good at fighting, he can't carry as many items, obviously. Yeah, yeah obviously <laughs> not, yeah. Um, can't even take a watch with him. Um, well, you know, you touched on Rick, obviously, as the evolution of the comic book goes, he loses Lord. He, is that, is that yeah. going to have a, an effect on, on the game, or is that going to be treading on the line of spoilers? or? No, I don't think so. I think every time you get um, the next expansion, mm -hmm. you're, you're advancing the story. Yeah. So when you get to Wave 2 and Wave 3 of our releases, you're advancing the story. Um, and I, I think those little campaign books that we're going to yeah. bring out with every expansion mm -hmm. kind of give you an update of the story so far and yeah. then show you the characters as they are Fantastic. at that stage. So each, each wave is kind of going to be a, here's what's happened in the comic books as well, now play it out on the field. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. And all of the rule wouldn't be called Laurie's dead, unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he would he would have some kind of unpredictability rule or yeah. something that'll just make him a little bit more cautious or yeah. you'll see his character reflected through those special rules. That's fantastic. So that'll obviously each time it's not like picking up the same character, you're gonna be I'm gonna choose this riff because he benefits me here. Yeah. Obviously in the list building side of it, that, that comes into more of the competitive playing, building your own lists. You're gonna have different iterations of the character that'll be more useful than other yeah. iterations of the character. Like and Rick's a great example because he's probably going to have more oh, versions yeah. Yeah. because he's the longest running character. Yeah. He's the protagonist, we see the world through his eyes. Yeah. When, he get, when he's in a dark patch, you know, we kind of think, oh, how would we react when that happens? Yeah. When he goes a little bit crazy, how yeah. do we represent that in the rules? And oh, then, he, then, he, then he's more hard bitten. I really hope he's designed carrying the telephone round with him under his arm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, glory, glory. Yeah. <laughs> like calling for air support. <laughs> <laughs> that would be impressive. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's basically character design, and we mentioned about throwing grenades out. Um, throwing grenades obviously make a lot of noise. This yeah. game has a threat tracker in it, which I think, from the games that, not only are The Walking Dead, but the games that I've played over the last year or so, it's been one of the most intuitive pieces of, of game design ever, because that oh, threat tracker, it just... It starts off all nice and calm, everyone's chilled out, we're just going for a leisurely stroll, there's a walker over there, I'll stay away from him. It's getting a little bit more tense here. Everyone, what's going on? Oh, shit. It's hit the fan. <laughs> and that's just, I mean, the, the game yourself and Tom played earlier on, um, which was going to be <coughs> as, a, as a battle report. It was recorded here at Mantic Games, the threat tracker, nice and calm for the first couple of rounds, yeah. and then once it hit, it was just mayhem and it literally swung the game, or well, almost swung the game. It often creeps up on you as well, yeah. so quite, so towards the end phase of the, of the game, mm -hmm. like when you get to like halfway through, yeah. start thinking, oh, should I start managing the threat or not? Yeah. Then if you don't, or yeah. a few random events happen that, that ramp the threat up a bit sooner, oh, yeah. then suddenly it's like, the idea is to give you that kind of pressure element. Yeah. You feel like you're under time pressure almost. Oh, yeah. like you've, got to, you've got to make these decisions, you've got to get it right, yeah. but if you don't, then... Um, you're going to start panicking and running away, or something crazy might happen. Yeah, um, it was, it, the, the threat tracker itself is, is fantastic, Alan. What 
how, how did that come about? Was that playing the game and you're thinking the mindset of, of being in that scenario? Or? Well, right from, right from the initial, um, when we formulated the brief essentially, mm -hmm. I was trying to think what, what can I do to give you that feeling of pressure? Yeah. Because, I mean, pressure isn't always fun. No. Doesn't always equate to fun. You can't think, oh, it's a tense game. That doesn't mean fun. Tense nervous headache. Yeah. So I didn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want chess clocks or anything crazy. Yeah. I, I wanted this idea that um, you suddenly felt like you, you're almost losing control over your yeah. guys unless you act. So you, yeah. you have to be able to get control back. Yeah. I, was, I started thinking about do I have some kind of clock mechanic, some kind of countdown to just yeah. kind of make you. Um, I don't know. So you have a few actions as the turns go on, and then it just didn't seem intuitive enough. Yeah. In the end, I decided actually your actions should make the threat go up and your actions can bring it down. Which makes sense, if you spend the game sneaking around yeah. and picking up the stuff quite slightly, you might bump into a wall here and there, if your positioning's poor, you can see them off quite easily. Yeah. However, then if you're going to do that, every time you're in melee, the threat goes up. Yeah. So you, you're basically counteracting the, the sneaky, quiet, I'm going to be safe players. And, and initially, we had this... to myself, or going ho, just yeah. I've got guns, <laughs> let's shoot and... In early versions, we had some instances where people would sneak around and get the loot mm -hmm. until they'd got an even number of loot each and the threat had hardly moved. Yeah. And then they'd have to fight over the last bit, yeah. which isn't as fun as you'd think. So no. that, that's why the event deck became so uh, a bit more random. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, I'm going to force your hand and you, you can't just sneak around because occasionally the walkers are going to move towards you and, yeah, you know, yeah. and eat you or something crazy is going to happen mm -hmm. or walkers are going to spawn on the objective. Or like, all that kind yeah, of stuff yeah, starts yeah, happening. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. Um, yeah, but the, the threat tracker, it's, it's fantastic. So, was there, was there anything that was influenced on in regards to the threat tracker? We mentioned throwing grenades. I believe yeah. there's a story about a certain individual that. There is a story, like yeah. Like chucking grenades <laughs> about. Uh, essentially, the, when, the, when the threat gets higher than your nerve value, you yeah. panic. Yeah. Um, and previously, it was easier to cause people to panic. Yeah. Um, but a certain person at Mantic, Ronnie! <laughs> um, he essentially loved grenades so much <laughs> that he's like, Mark, you've got to make this easier. Because <laughs> I want to throw these grenades. Yeah. And essentially that's, that's the, how the evolution works. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll find some other way to make the threat yeah. kind of work and balance. So Ronnie playtested it and made it because he liked throwing grenades. He liked throwing grenades. So that adjusted the threat. And, and he used his semantic CEO status to get extra grenade cards too. <laughs> so you always have a few spare. <laughs> Well, hopefully one day I'll be able to thank him for that, because yeah. uh, Negan likes throwing grenades about, and I like Negan. I just haven't had a chance to play with him properly in a competitive setting. So hopefully that's gonna gonna change. So uh, that pretty much covers all the questions we've got on The Walking Dead, but you have yeah. designed some other fantastic games oh, as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, you've, you've been part of those games, like yeah. the Batman Miniatures game. What was it that you done with them? So the Night Models, that is? Yeah, Night Models. I've got a, a long-standing relationship with those guys. Yeah. Um, so it started with the Batman Miniatures game, mm -hmm. where they basically done um, th the game in Spanish. Yeah. And they got a, a kind of a rough translation. Which is that the PDF? Which is the free PDF. Yeah. Um, I couldn't play the game off reading that PDF. <laughs> some, some people struggle. It, it, it was a game you had to work at. Yeah, yeah uh, definitely. But to, to be fair to those guys, none of them were native English speakers. No, so, right, that's so, so they, they just basically took on on faith that that yeah. was correct. Uh, <laughs> And so when I when I joined that team, mm -hmm. um, I basically said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite these from the ground up. Yeah. And that kind of prompted um, mm -hmm. doing the hardback rulebook. Fantastic. Um, okay. So I'm kind of down with the editor slash translator. Yeah. Not not a true translator. I used to be fluent Spanish, but I know enough to get to get yeah, by yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Um, and then I did a similar thing with the Marvel miniatures game and the DC Universe yeah, miniatures game. Which are both going to be heavily featured on the channel over the next, next year. Fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, uh, both myself and Tom are really into those games. Um, uh, so we've picked up a couple of the sets for that. So Great, they're going to be put you all over the place. And you're currently also working on another Night Models project, is that correct? Yeah, well, those previous two, the advantage was I was there for the start, so I was able right. to be more of a consultant on those. So I actually sort of rough drafted the rules and had a bit of feedback for yeah. them, and as well as doing the editing and translation. Uh, but now, right from the start of, of this next project, yeah. I think sure you will know by now that Harry Potter, Harry Potter miniatures, miniatures game. game. Yeah, that, that's the next big thing for Night Models. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, just in two days' time, I'm off to Madrid to work on that. Those guys. Nice. I'm not the lead designer. I can't take credit for it. No. Um, but it's a really exciting license. I'm yeah. helping out much as I can. Definitely. So you've had you've had some pretty impressive licenses in the in the past. Then so you've Walking Dead, Atlantic Games, yeah. Marvel, DC, 
Batman with um, night models and now also Harry Potter with night models. And also my first ever license for the Lord of the Rings movies with the Games Workshop. That's where Was I started it? my design career. Wow, I didn't know that. So Mark, yeah. you are actually responsible for me getting into this hobby. Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's something I didn't know actually. I've done a little bit of reading up about him before this interview. I didn't know that Lord uh, sorry the um, Lord of the Rings. IP was, was something you worked on? Yeah, so back in the day when GW first got the license, they did a part work yeah. in the UK called Battle Games in Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. And my very first gig in the industry was working on that. Right. Um, and I became the editor of that and then went from there. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so I've got you to thank for getting me into uh, tabletop games. Well, I didn't know that, so you're most welcome. <laughs> right, well, I think that's all, all we've got time for today. And thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really great. appreciate it. Cheers. Good luck with uh, Harry Potter. And no doubt, hopefully once that's out, you'll sit down with me again and have a chat about that. I'll be happy to, yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much for your great time, stuff. guys. Cheers. See you all soon. Bye, Take it everyone. easy. Bye.